Uh, so like everybody else, I have too many slides. I try to put the more interesting ones at the beginning and the more technical ones at the end. So we'll probably run over. Uh, but feel free to talk and talk to me at the end, and uh, there's a lot to discuss. Uh, hopefully, an informal meeting like this is the, the right place. So uh, the first part of what I'll be talking about is what we have learned from uh, this NASA instrument called Doppler Scat. Um, it's uh, a very small instrument that, that's about, you know, it's less than a meter by a meter. It goes from the bottom of an airplane, and it has a, a scanning antenna. And the idea is, unlike the SAR instruments, um, you actually, and like SKIM, you, you scan around so that at any point on the ground, you actually get to uh, see it from two different positions. And from those two different observations, uh, usually we get more. Uh, you infer vectors, not just the magnitude of the currents. Uh, the thing to notice is that there are places where you're almost 90 degrees. The, there you get very good determination. There are places like in the far swath or near the, the nadir uh, where you don't have as good a determination, so the errors will grow. Uh, so the first part, I'm just going to give you a preview of some science results that, that we've gotten. Um, and the sort of capabilities and, and uh, things that we could get from a spaceborne mission, hopefully, in, in the long term. So the, this is uh, the outflow of the Mississippi River. You have a strong plume coming over here. Uh, the lighter uh, water yeah, contains sediments from the Mississippi River and from the bayous and the Louisiana coast. There's a strong plume here and a recirculation to Barataria Bay. What we get from our instrument in terms of Doppler, uh, this is the, the U component. So blue is going uh, west, red is going east. And as you can see, the strong plume and the recirculation, a strong sub scale front over here, strong uh, 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 strain over here. Uh, so that's the sort of capability that we have from our instrument. One of the things that you can start to do once you have uh, vectors rather than just single components, you can start to take a look at the quantities that are of greater interest for oceanography. Uh, so you can get something like the relative vorticity. So this is in units of uh, relative vorticity over F. Most of the time, at long, uh, wider scales, you get something less than one. But at the sub scales, you can see we get very, very strong relative vorticity concentrated in the positive side along fronts uh, and with the negative side, which is unstable, uh, spread more widely. Not only do you, do you get the, the relative vorticity, but you can also start to see uh, the divergence, which is an indication of the vertical velocity that you, you hope to get from uh, uh, surface current. So, at these areas, this one corresponds to that strong sub scale front that we saw earlier. So you have uh, fresh water over here, the recirculation of the saltier water from there, sinking at this vertical front, and then there's the, the meeting of the fresh water here and the current going along the coast here. Again, uh, a strong uh, convergence over here. So uh, for these images, the resolution of the instrument is 200 meters. For these images, uh, in order to get rid of some of the wave components, they've averaged to about two kilometers. Uh, earlier, uh, the only place where you could have gotten sub scale distribution of relative vorticity and divergence is very localized area of measurements from the LATMIX experiment. So basically, these are two ships traveling in parallel using, using ADCPs. So you can calculate uh, the relative vorticity between these two ships and the divergence. What they found, uh, this is a paper by Andre Sherbina and company, uh, is that the relative vorticity was uh, strongly skewed towards the positive side. The negative side is unstable, so you see less of it. Whereas the, uh, the divergence, they have a bit more convergence than divergence, but it was less skewed. And the strain rate, I'm, I'm, we, we've calculated, but uh, I will show it to you. So these are from ship measurements. These are the same quantities that we get from Doppler scat. And uh, you, know, you can look at the numbers, but basically, there's very good agreement between one and the other. The other thing that we get from Doppler scat is uh, the surface stress, basically the backside of cross-section. 
And you can see here, this is uh, converted to neutral winds. And you can see the plume and the recirculation. And this drop that you see along the plume and the recirculation is not really a drop in the, in the winds, but it's a drop in the, in the stress. Because here, the winds are traveling with the current. Here, the winds are traveling against the current. Uh, so what you expect to see is uh, this modulation of the winds by the current. And one of the key issues in the coupling of, of winds air sea interaction is over what scales those interactions take place. Because if there's a very strong wind stress curl uh, that happens over very short distances, then you have a very strong vertical forcing. Uh, and so this is the wind stress curl got computed from, uh, from these data. And I just want to emphasize that the, the wind stress curl comes from the backscatter cross section, which is unrelated to the Doppler. So it's an independent quantity. But you can see the, the same sort of features that you saw in the, uh, in the current, except they have the opposite sign. And this is exactly what you would see, what you'd expect to see if you have this modulation of the stress by the current. And it's happening at very small scales. So that has strong implications on recirculation. If you do a cross-correlation between the two of them, you can see this very strong uh, negative correlation between the two of them. OK, going on. Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago, we got the good news that uh, we have been approved for a five-year campaign called the S-Mode Submissive Scale Ocean Dynamics Experiment that's uh, part of the NASA Earth Venture Suborbital. Uh, Tom Farrar at HUI will be the PI. We will have uh, Doppler scat, LIDAR, plus hyperspectral, and ocean color, plus uh, lots of things on, in, in the water. So this will be a great opportunity to learn and make the case for the sub scale as we go on to the skim era and the Wacom era. Um, phenomenology, I think Bertrand alluded to the fact that we're measuring wave, not currents. And the currents are just what we hope to pull out. So one of the things that uh, we worry about is that, uh, especially as you go to higher frequencies, that the waves will change too quickly. And uh, we, from the data that we have, uh, we are able to look at the correlation and in different directions. And from that correlation, we can estimate how, how long the uh, correlation time for the ocean is. We see that it's about, uh, well, it depends on wind speed, obviously, but it's about somewhere between three milliseconds and one millisecond, which is good enough for us to do our, our measurements. Another thing to worry about is whether K band, which is not as tried as KU band, is sufficient to measure winds. And uh, the typical way that we do that in scatterometry is to take a look at uh, geophysical model function. This is the, in black, is the quick scat geophysical model function at KU. And in blue is our data, so you can see there's a strong dependence on wind speed that gives us a good indication that K band is good for uh, estimating wind speed. And then if you look at the upwind, downwind, crosswind, there's a very strong modulation, stronger than a KU band. So that gives us a good indication that we can estimate the, um, uh, the direction. For the current, again, we're measuring a net effect of the modulation of the waves on Bragg scatterers. At these frequencies, Bragg scatterers are half a centimeter capillary waves. There's all sorts of theories, and the theories are sort of OK. But uh, the proof is in the pudding to see how this will behave as a function of uh, wind speed. So uh, this is the simplest theory. It tells you that uh, the Bragg waves propagate uh, at, uh, with the Bragg velocity. It's about 30 centimeters per second. And you see at very low wind speeds, in fact, they do that when you're looking upwind, or when you're looking uh, upwind or downwind. This is what you see. As the uh, wind increases, then you start to generate uh, bound waves. And uh, you also start to develop the spectrum. And so you see that that modulation increases all the way to about 4.5 meters per second. Now, typical theory will tell you that this should keep increasing. But observations tell us that uh, we see this very nice saturation effect that happens all the way up to maybe 12 and a half meters per second. Uh, and so the fact that this is steady says that, at least empirically, we have a very good chance of removing this wave effect and just uh, keep the current effect. Uh, in fact, this is not too far off 
uh, from other measurements that have been made uh, in wave tanks or in the field uh, using modulation transfer function. Uh, if that means nothing to you, you probably, uh, I, I don't have time to explain it, but basically the modulation transfer function is something that tells you how in a linear way the, the spectrum of the waves modulates the spectrum of the backscatter cross-section. And you can see it that uh, the real and imaginary part which determines the phase uh, that we observe is sort of in the same order of magnitude as has been observed by, other, by others. Um, very important for going into space is how do you calibrate uh, this? Roland uh, showed that when you use uh, two antennas, the phase calibration is a very challenging thing. So uh, when you use a single antenna, that's not as challenging. You don't get quite the same accuracy. Or the, but uh, the, ba the basic thing that you're challenged with is knowing where exactly that antenna is pointed. And, and so that's a challenging thing. And we have to use the data itself to figure out where the antenna is pointed. So uh, this is our data before we calibrate for the antenna. And basically, these are uh, collected over a period of an hour. You see when you're going in one direction, you see one thing. When you're going the opposite direction, you see the other thing. Uh, and when you look at the currents, when you're going in one direction, you see one thing. When you're going the opposite direction, you see another thing. So the current impact the estimate of how shifted you are with your antenna. What we found is that you really, really needed to average and to uh, look at different directions. And in fact, you, no longer, you needed to estimate not a single harmonic, but you need to estimate multiple harmonics. So this probably doesn't mean anything if you're not an instrument person, but it's, it's a challenge for the space-borne instrument. Uh, how, you, how, 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 how much did you average? Just in my interest, I didn't time. So for this, we only average, uh, to get these data, this is about an hour data collection going both ways, and we have four passes. So it's about four hours. So in fact, these estimates are almost instantaneous, mm -hmm. and you get very good estimates, but they're shifted by the current. Mm -hmm. So you need to average out the current. So really, is the currents that determine more than the precision of the, in, of the measurement. So you get very good bias estimates, and you need to remove those biases. Um, error model validation, if, if we're going to sell a spaceborne mission, we have to know how well it performs. One of the things that uh, we learned was that uh, the, uh, to develop an error model that we could uh, use for predictions. And uh, let me just say that the blue dots are the errors as you spin around that we observe. Our updated error function is this orange thing. It agrees very well. The, the green thing is if you're very naive and assume that each pulse has a, is an independent uh, thing, no matter how fast you pulse. And so you, you can tend to overcount, and you, you can tend to be too optimistic. And, and so that's something that we need to take into account when we go into space. Uh, so we've been looking at a space-borne design uh, slightly different philosophy from, from SKIM. Uh, I think SKIM is great and very complementary to what we're looking at. So I'll just give you a little bit of an indication of uh, how our design has gone and where we could use uh, some of these hints for SKIM. So the first one, which is the most applicable to SKIM, is that uh, we're really measuring the pulse to pulse. So we transmit a bunch of pulses, and we have the latitude of moving them around, separating them. If you separate them too much, uh, this is, wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Microsoft. Uh, uh, so this is sort of uh, what the error function is, is looking at. Uh, but the important thing is that it's inversely proportional to the, uh, to the time separation between these things. So you want to, if you want to estimate a velocity, you want to spread the pulses as much as you can. However, if you spread them too much, then you're decorrelated. So that's one thing that you need to worry about. The other thing that you need to worry about is if you want to put in a bunch of pulses, if you want to put them really close together, then each pulse has less energy. So you really want to spread them around so that they all have more energy. One of the things that we learned is that when we're looking broadside, so this is my velocity direction, this is broadside, you're mostly correlated in that direction. But as you swing here, you're more and more correlated. And so you can actually be a little bit smart and, start and separate the pulses differentially depending on whether you're looking broadside or you're looking forward. And you may think this is a small effect, but in fact, if you could read this, uh, but I'll read it to you, if you 
designed things for looking at broadside uh, and th this is the broadside performance and then you opt if you don't optimize things your error can be almost an order of magnitude worse than it, it could be if you optimize things so the system timing is something that, that you need to worry about another thing that uh, uh, we were worried about was uh, temporal decorrelation that happens uh, because of undersampling. Uh, so one of the things in the system design is where the incidence angles that you pick are going to be. Skim has picked them to be relatively shallow incidence angles because they're very strong, uh, backscatter cross-sucking, very good precision. Uh, we decided to go the opposite way and uh, pick them at around 56 degrees. The idea is that when you go to 56 degrees, uh, your SWAT is about 1,700 kilometers, and your revisit time is about twice per day. So if you look at uh, what you have, th this is some work that Dolly Chelton has done. So this is uh, uh, vorticity images. Uh, and uh, this is true. This is with some errors. And this is sampling as SWAT would sample them. So SWAT has a 150-kilometer SWAT. So it's a gross case of undersampling. And you see that you're dominated by the sampling errors. If you start with something which has a lot more noise, uh, even if it has a lot more noise, uh, because you're sampling correctly, you recover something which is very close to what you started with. One of the things that we need to really worry about is uh, inertial signatures and tidal signatures. And so that's why in the Wacom model, we try to go to twice per day, and something like twice per day. So when we take temporal averages, those uh, signatures tend to advertise, and we sometimes resolve them. The final thing uh, is that uh, what we would like to do, and again, thank you, Microsoft, is to have uh, not this funny skim sampling pattern, but to sample everything at least twice as we go along. And that's a challenge if you go, if you sample very quickly, because your ambiguous swath is very small on the order of six kilometers when you're sampling in the broadside direction. But again, if you're smart and you change your timing, you're, uh, you can actually improve the ambiguous swath significantly. And so you can go from about six kilometers to on the order of a thousand kilometers. And so if you have a long and skinny antenna, you can actually get full coverage the entire time uh, and not have any gaps. Uh, the final thing is just to give you an example of how well we think uh, Wacom is going to work, the Winds and Current Mission. It may change its name, uh, but right now there is no Wacom design. We're, we're running behind SKIM. It has been designated by the uh, U.S. Decadal Survey as a potential mission to be competed again in an Earth Explorer. And my guess is that if it goes, it'll, it'll be... Uh, a little bit later than skim, but hopefully the two of them uh, will happen at the same time as they're complementary. Uh, our performance depends on how much power we have and what antenna size we have. Uh, but if we, we are leveraging the SWAT antenna, so we, we have that technology, SWAT antenna is about five meters, so that's what, how we compensate for going at a, at a wider incidence angle. We need, we need more power. And uh, so these are the the, in the two components in centimeters per second. This is if you have 100 watts transmit power, 400 watts transmit power, and one and a half kilowatts like SWAT. This is 10 centimeters per second. And what you see is, is that, uh, and less, uh, this uh, are quoted at five kilometer resolution. So if you wanted to go to 25 kilometer resolution, which is still very small sub scale, this would be down by a factor of five. And so you see that uh, you can get sub 10 centimeter per second uh, resolution uh, using 400 watts and maybe on the order of 20 to 30 centimeters per second using on the order of 100 watts. And that's a, one of the things that we're looking at right now. And that's the end of my talk. So very, very nice, uh, very nice instrument. So 
looking forward to, to see the data more closely. So uh, you, you, you had these this small gaps on, on the side uh, for Doppler scat. No, you have the, the gap at the nadir beam and the gap uh, on the side. And what, what, what are these gaps uh, in the data? So the gaps are gaps of shame where I didn't want to show how bad the errors are. So when the error, the formal error, is above uh, 30 centimeters per second or something like that, I, I cover it up. And I don't claim to have any data there. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but we'll have the same with Kim. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I think we should just cut it. And we've been cut a lot. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that uh, actually the the thing to take a look at, and I think this is true for skin as well, and I think uh, Clément Huberman is, is going to talk about it, the radial velocity is best at the center where those gaps are. And if you actually use optimal interpolation, the information from the sides can be brought to, you, to bear using this. And so right now we're uh, covering our gap of shame with some fancy wear from uh, optimal interpolation. But uh, I didn't want to show that. I wanted to be pessimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, last question, Christine. Um, so our work in uh, C star, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So our, talk, uh, our work with C star showed that we need to have three azimuth view uh, directions to be able to unravel the current and the uh, the wind uh, effects. Uh, my understanding is you only have two azimuth oh. angles. Is that right? We are, in this, we only have one beam, and uh, the way to estimate the winds that we have found is to actually use the Doppler information together with the backscatter information to resolve the 180 degree ambiguities. Yeah, we do that as well, and we still need three directions. We seem to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but in a way, you have more. Yeah, you're not fixed. Yeah. You're not fixed, so, so you have the, the trick to have uh, some time more.